1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So Paul's use of finally here does not mean he's finished. It means here he has began the closing section of the letter with practical instruction on how God wants his people to live. The word rendered finally, loipon, is an adverbial accusative as for the rest and serves to mark a transition rather than a conclusion. So Paul was thankful for the growth that he saw in the Thessalonians, but still looked for them to abound more and more and walk that would uh, in a walk that would please God. And this means that Christian maturity is never finished on this side of eternity. No matter how far a Christian has come in love and holiness, he or she can still abound more and more. And so what Paul wrote in the following verses was nothing new to the Thessalonians. And just uh, in the few weeks he was with them, he instructed them in these basic matters of Christian morality. And Paul knew it was important to instruct new believers in these things. And Paul took it for granted that the Thessalonians understood that the purpose of their walk, their manner, manner of living, was to please God and not themselves. When the Christian has this basic understanding, the following instruction regarding biblical morality will make sense. When a man is saved by the work of Christ, for him it does not lie open before him as a matter for his completely free decision whether he will serve God or not. He has been bought with a price in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20, and he has become the slave of Christ. And so these were not suggestions from the pen of Paul. These are commandments from the Lord Jesus and must be received that way. And so commandments is, uh, it is more at home in the military environment, being the usual word for the commands given by an officer to his men. Its use is also in Acts chapter 5 verse 28 and chapter 16 verse 24. It is thus a word with a ring of authority in it. Verses 3 through 6. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust. Like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. So Paul gave these commands to a first century Roman culture that was marked by sexual immorality. At this time in the Roman Empire, chastity and sexual purity were almost unknown virtues. Nevertheless, Christians were to take their standards for, of sexual morality from God and not from the culture. Paul said this was a commandment in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 2, and uh, that word was a military term describing an order from an officer to a subordinate, and the order came from Jesus and not from Paul. And In the Roman Empire, uh, the ancient writer Demosthenes expressed the generally amoral view of sex in the ancient Roman Empire, where he says, We keep prostitutes for pleasure, we keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body, and we keep wives for the faithful guardianship of our homes. Right? That was the, the viewpoint in the Roman Empire during that time. We are not too far from that in today's culture. And Paul made it very clear what the will of God was for the Christian. The idea behind sanctification is to be set apart. And God wants us to be set apart from a godless culture and its sexual immorality. If our sexual behavior is no different than the Gentiles who do not know God, then we are not sanctified or set apart in the way God wants us to be. So those who do not know God do not have the spiritual resources to walk pure before the Lord, but Christians do. Therefore, Christians should live differently than those who do not know God. And we live differently than the world when we abstain from sexual immorality. The ancient Greek word translated sexual immorality or pornea is a broad word. It refers to any sexual relationship outside the marriage covenant. And so the older King James Version will translate sexual immorality as fornication. Uh, fornication is used here in its comprehensive meaning to denote every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse. And uh, the broad nature of the word pornea in the Greek will show that it isn't enough to just say that you have not had sexual intercourse with someone who is not your spouse. It's uh, God grants great sexual liberty in the marriage relationship, Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. But Satan's not very subtle strategy is often to do 
all he can to encourage sex outside of the marriage and dis, uh, and discourage sex in the marriage. So we live differently than the world when we possess our body in sanctification and in honor. Immorality is the opposite of honor because it degrades and debases the self. Uh, those who do not restrain their sexual desires act more like animals than humans, following every impulse without restraint. The phrase that each of you should know indicates that the, de- that the demand being made applies to each individual member of the church. The same moral standards hold for all. Some will interpret this passage so that the vessel each one should possess is a wife, and that Paul here encouraged Christians to get married and express their sexuality in marriage instead of immorality. Yet it seems that instead Paul meant to encourage each Christian to possess or hold his own body vessel in a way that honored God. Sexual immorality is a sin against one's own body in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 where it will say, Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And so, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So this plainly means that the sexual conduct of the Christian should be different than the prevailing permissiveness of the day, and in today's culture as well. And so the Gentiles knew gods who were the personification of their own ambitions and lust, but they did not know the true God, the God who is himself holy and wills the sanctification of his followers. When we are sexually immoral, we take advantage of and defraud others, and we cheat them in greater ways than we can imagine. The adulterer defrauds his mate and children. The fornicator defrauds his future mate and children, and both defraud their illicit partner. So adultery is an obvious violation of the rights of another. But promiscuity before marriage represents the robbing of the other, that virginity which ought to be brought into the marriage. The future partner of such a one has been defrauded. So repeatedly in Leviticus chapter 18, which is a chapter where God instructed Israel on the matter of sexual morality, the idea is given that one may not uncover the nakedness of another, not their spouse. The idea is that the nakedness of an individual belongs to his or her spouse and no one else, and is a violation of God's law to give that nakedness to anyone else or for anyone else to take it. Verse 6 through 8. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So this is the first of four reasons for sexual purity. The Lord is the avenger of all such. Uh, We can trust that God will punish sexual immorality so that no one gets away with the sin, even if it's undiscovered. And this is... a. For God didn't call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. That's the second reason why Christians should be sexually pure. It's because of our call. That call is not to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, sexual immorality is simply inconsistent with who we are in Jesus Christ. Paul developed this same line of thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, and chapter 6, verses 15-20, through 20, concluding with the idea that we should glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man but God. So the third reason for sexual purity is because to reject God's call to sexual purity is not rejecting man but God himself. Despite the petty ways that many rationalize sexual immorality, we still reject God when we sin in this way. And so Paul's strong command here did not seem to come because the Thessalonians were deep in sin. No specific sin is mentioned. It seems that this was meant to prevent sin rather than to rebuke sin. In light of the prevailing low standards in their society and because of the seductive strength of sexual immorality. And so, who has given us the the Holy Spirit? His Holy Spirit. And so this is the fourth of four reasons for sexual purity given in this passage. We have been given the Holy Spirit, who empowers the willing, trusting Christian to overcome sexual sin. By His Spirit, God has given us the resources for victory, We are responsible to use those resources. Verse 9 and 10. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. 
So these principles are so basic that, that Paul knew that they were obvious to the Thessalonian Christians. The Thessalonians were taught by God about the importance of love, yet we must all be reminded. And it wasn't that the Thessalonians were without love. Their love towards all the brethren was very well known, but they had to increase more and more in their love. Verse 11, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we have committed you. So this means that we should have an aspiration or ambition in life, and that we should aspire to lead a quiet life. Aspire has the thought of ambition and is translated that way in several versions of the Bible. Quiet has the thought of peace, calm, rest, and satisfaction. And so the quiet life contradicts the hugely successful modern attraction to entertainment and excitement. This addiction to entertainment and excitement is damaging both spiritually and culturally. We might say that excitement and entertainment are like a religion for many people today. The religion has a god, the self. The religion has a priest, celebrities. This religion has a prophet, uh, perpetual entertainment. This religion has scriptures, the tabloids and entertainment, news and informational programs. And this religion has places of worship, amusement parks, theaters, concert halls, sports arenas. And we could say that every television and internet connection uh, is a little chapel. And so the religion of excitement and entertainment seduces people into living their lives for one thing, the thrill of the moment. But these thrills are quickly over and forgotten, and all that is important is the next fun thing. And this religion uh, conditions its followers to only ask one question, is it fun? It never wants us to ask more important questions such as, is it true, is it right, is it good, or is it godly? So we need to live the quiet life so that we can really take the time and give the attention to listen to God. When we live the quiet life, we can listen to God and get to know Him better. And so, mind your own business. This means that the Christian must focus on his or her own life and matters instead of meddling in the lives of others. Mind your own business is a biblical idea. And so Paul, however, does not mean that every individual is to mind his own business in such a way that all are to live apart from one another and have no concern for others, but simply wants to correct the idle triviality which makes men open disturbers of the peace when they ought to lead a quiet life at home. And we must recognize the dignity and honor of work. Work is God's plan for the progress of society and the church. We fall into Satan's snare when we expect things to always come easily, to sit back and just do nothing or to regard God's blessing as an opportunity for laziness, right? Playing video games for eight hours a day over and over and over again, you will realize very quickly that you accomplish absolutely nothing other than spending your money and wasting your time. And so manual labor was despised by ancient Greek culture. They thought that the better a man was, the less he should work. In contrast, God gave us a carpenter king, fishermen apostles, and tent-making missionaries. <clears throat> for a reason that we are to model after them and so there is nothing more disgraceful than an idle good for nothing who is of no use either to himself or to others it seems to have been born merely to just eat and drink and consume verse 12 that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing so when we combine the love of our brothers with work we walk properly People who are not yet Christians, those who are outside, will see our example and be influenced to become followers of Jesus. And so Paul completes the thought he began in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, that we may see your face and perfect and what is lacking in your faith. If they followed his teaching and example, they would lack nothing and would come to the place of genuine Christian maturity. Verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. All right. So in the few weeks that Paul was with the Thessalonians, he emphasized the soon return of Jesus. And the Thessalonians believed it earnestly. This was part of the reason that they were the kind of church that Paul complimented so highly. Yet after Paul left, they wondered about those Christians who died before Jesus came back. All right, this is very important verses coming up, so pay attention. So they were troubled by the idea that these Christians might miss out on the great future event and that they might miss the victory and blessing of Jesus coming. All right, this is what we're going to come up on is uh, talking about the rapture or the harpazo. And so it is with some interest that we note four times in his letters, Paul asks Christians to not be ignorant about something. He says, don't be ignorant about God's plan for Israel in Romans 11, verse 25. 
where he says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. He also says, Do not be ignorant about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Don't be ignorant about suffering and trials in the Christian life. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. And don't be ignorant about the rapture and the second coming of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, where he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So, remarkably, uh, and I don't understand how, but these are areas where ignorance is still vastly common in the Christian world today. Every single one of those subjects. And it's in black and white. <clears throat> Yet, in mass, people are getting it wrong. All right, so who have fallen asleep? Let's continue on. So sleep was a common way to express death in the ancient world, but among the pagans, it was almost always seen as an eternal sleep. And so ancient writings are full of pessimism regarding uh, death. If a man once dead, there is no resurrection. Uh, Sucleus, uh, hopes are among the living, the dead are without hope. Theocritus. Uh, suns may set and rise again, but we, when our brief light goes down, we must sleep an endless night. Uh, that's Catullus. So Christians called death sleep, but they emphasized the idea of rest. Early Christians began to call their burial place cemeteries, which means dormitories or sleeping places. Yet the Bible never describes the death of the unbeliever as sleep, for there is no rest, peace, or comfort for them in death. So though Paul, using idioms that were common in his day, referred to death as sleep, it does not prove the erroneous idea of soul sleep, that the present dead in Christ are in some sort of state of suspended animation, waiting for the resurrection to consciousness. Uh, because Philippians chapter 1, verse 23 clearly says, Since to depart from this world in death is to be with Christ, as described by Paul, is, is very far better. Um, <clears throat> where he says, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Right? Uh, then the present state of a blessed communion with the Lord and blessed activity in his service. It is evident that sleep, as applied to believers, cannot be intended to teach that the soul is unconscious. It can't be. And so, for the Christian, death is dead, and leaving this body is like laying down for a nap and waking in glory. It is moving, not dying. For these reasons, Christians should not sorrow as others who have no hope when their loved ones die and Jesus die. <laughs> they have to be Christian, right? And so as Christians, we may mourn the death of other Christians, but not as others who have no hope. Our sorrow is like the sadness of seeing someone off on a long trip, knowing that you're going to see them again, but not for a long time. But when you see them the next time, it will be for a long time because we'll be on eternity. <laughs> Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So we have more than just a wishful hope of resurrection. In the resurrection of Jesus, we have an amazing example of it and a promise of our own. For the Thessalonian Christians, their troubled minds were answered by the statement, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. It's best to understand the words to mean that Jesus will bring the faithful departed with him when he comes back. Their death does not mean that they will miss their share in the uh, parousia. And so Jesus died. So when Paul wrote about the death of believers, he called it sleep. But in his description of Jesus' death, he did not soften it by calling it sleep because there's nothing soft or peaceful about his death. He endured the worst that death can possibly be. It is because there was no softening of the horror of death for him, that there was no horror of death for his people. For them, it is but sleep. And so, this is uh, the confident belief of the Apostle Paul and the early Christians. We will certainly live, because Jesus lives, and our union with him is stronger than death. This is why we do not sorrow as those who have no hope, and why we have more than a wishful hope. 
So when a sinner dies, we mourn for them. When a believer dies, we only mourn for ourselves because they are with the Lord. All right, they're having the time of their life. So in the ruins of ancient Rome, you can see the magnificent tombs of pagans with gloomy inscriptions on them. Uh, one of them will read, I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. Uh, <laughs> Or one can visit the murky catacombs and read glorious inscriptions. Uh, one of the most common Christian epitaphs from the catacombs was in peace, quoting Psalm 4, verse 8, where he says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, and make me dwell in safety. So we should look at death in the same way those early Christians did. Sadly, not all Christians are at this place of confidence and peace. Even Christians have, in unbelief, had the same fear and hopelessness about death. The author once read an inscription reflecting this unchristian despair on an Irish tombstone in a Christian cemetery on the Hill of Slain outside of Dublin, where it said, O cruel death, you may well boast, of all tyrants thou art the most. As you all mortals can control, the Lord have mercy on my soul. 1782. All right, verse 15 and 16. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So Paul emphasized that this was an authoritative command by the word of the Lord, though we do not know whether Paul received it by direct revelation or if it's an unrecorded saying of Jesus. One way or another, uh, this came from Jesus and it did not originate with Paul. <clears throat> and so in no place does the apostle speak more confidently and positively of his inspiration than right here. And we should prepare ourselves to receive some momentous and interesting truth. So Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know that those who are asleep, Christians who have died before Jesus returns, will by no means be at a disadvantage. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede them. God will allow those who are asleep to share in the glory of the coming of the Lord. So the living will have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. They will not meet the returning Christ ahead of the dead, nor will they have any precedence in the blessedness at his coming. And so we who are alive means that Paul himself shared this expectancy. It's, it wasn't because Paul had an erroneous promise of the return of Jesus in his lifetime. More feasible is the solution that Paul sees setting an example of expectancy for the church of all ages. Proper Christian anticipation includes the imminent return of Christ. And so when Jesus comes, he will come personally. The, the Lord himself will descend and come with a shout. The ancient Greek word for shout here is the same word used for commands that a ship captain makes to his rowers or a commander speaking to his soldiers. Always there is a ring of authority and a note of urgency. And so, apparently there will be some audible signal that prompts this remarkable event. It may be that all three descriptions, shout, voice, and trumpet, refer to the same sound, or there may be three distinct sounds. The rapture will not be silent or secret, though the vast majority of people may not understand the sound or its meaning. When Paul heard the heavenly voice on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, verse 7 and 22, verse 9, his companions heard the sound of a voice, but they did not hear articulate words. They heard a sound, but they did not understand its meaning. It may well be that the shout, voice, and trumpet uh, sound that accompanies the rapture uh, will have the same effect. The entire world may hear this heavenly sound, but have no idea what its meaning is. And I'll point out, rapture is a Latin term, but you, if you look up in your Strong's Concordance, harpazo will be the Greek word that's used here. <clears throat> it's a, it means like a snatching away. And so with the voice of an archangel, so this doesn't mean that the Lord himself is an archangel. Uh, the only one described as an archangel in the Bible is Michael in Jude verse 9. Uh, Paul means that when Jesus comes, he will come in the company of prominent angels. And so the voice of an archangel means that Paul clearly did not designate a specific archangel. It's even possible that he does not mean that an archangel will actually say something, but simply that the voice that will be uttered will be a very great voice, an archangel type of voice. And believers are gathered with the trumpet of God. In the Old Testament, trumpets sounded the alarm for war, and they threw the enemy into a panic. In the sense of the seven trumpets as described in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, where it says, when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. 
Uh, Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, you have the trumpets blowing there for the judgments. And trumpets also sounded an assembly of God's people, as in Leviticus 23, verse 24, where it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. And Numbers chapter 10, verse 2, Make two silver trumpets for yourself, and you shall make them of hammered work. And so here the trumpet of God gathers together God's people. It was by the sound of the trumpet that the solemn assemblies under the law were convoked, and to such convocations there appears to be here an allusion. There are three other associations of trumpets and end times events. One is the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 where it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. That's referring to the rapture there. And which seems clearly to be connected with the same trumpet here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The others are the seven trumpets which culminate at Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 where it says, Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so in the trumpet gathering of the elect in Israel at the end of the age in Matthew 24 verse 31 where he says he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and so you can compare the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 the subjects are different here it is the church there it's a wicked world right the it's the church in first Thessalonians chapter 4 it's the wicked world in revelation the results are different here it's the glorious catching up of the church to be with the lord there it's the further judgment upon a godless world here the last trump signals the close of the life of the church on earth there the seventh trumpet marks the climax in a progressive series of apocalyptic judgments upon the living on earth so as to the trumpet in first thessalonians chapter 4 and the one that's mentioned in matthew 24 verse 31 we can also observe that the subjects are different matthew refers to jewish believers during the great tribulation thessalonians referring to the church the circumstances are also different. Matthew refers to a gathering of the elect scattered over the earth with no mention of resurrection. Thessalonians refers to the raising of the believing dead. The results are also different because Matthew refers to living believers gathered from all over the earth at the command of their Lord who has returned to earth in open glory. Thessalonians refers to the uniting of the raised dead with the living believers to meet the Lord in the air. So, Paul's point to the Thessalonians is clear. The prior dead in Christ will not be left out of either the resurrection or the return of Jesus. In fact, they will experience it first. <clears throat> so many wonder how the dead in Christ are raised first. Some believe that they have now temporary bodies and await the, this resurrection. Others believe that they are now disembodied spirits who wait for resurrection. Still others conjecture that the dead in Christ experience their resurrection immediately. So there will come a day when, in God's eternal plan, the dead in Christ will receive their resurrection bodies. Yet until that day, we are confident that the dead in Christ are not in some kind of soul sleep or suspended animation. Paul made it clear that to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. So either the present dead in Christ are with the Lord in a spiritual body awaiting their final resurrection body, or because of the nature of timeless eternity, they have received their resurrection bodies already because they live in the eternal now. And so, <clears throat> depending on how complex your view of physics is um, and hyperspaces, you'll be able to kind of understand that they could be already there. <clears throat> So however God will do it, we are confident that his promise is true. Though the bones be scattered to the four winds of heaven, yet at the call of the Lord God they shall come together again, bone to this bone. And we no doubt that God will guard the dust of the precious sons and daughters of Zion. Verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. All right, so here we go. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's your harpot, so that caught up right there, or rapture, together with them. Those alive and remaining until this coming of Jesus are caught up to meet Jesus in the air, 
together with the dead in Jesus who have already risen. So the verb translated caught up here will mean to seize or to carry off by force. There is often the notion of a sudden swoop, usually that of a force which cannot be resisted. In the ancient Greek, the phrase to meet was used as a technical term to describe the official welcoming of honored guests. This passage is the basis for the New Testament doctrine of the rapture, the catching away of believers to be with Jesus. The word rapture is not in the ancient Greek text. It comes from the Latin Vulgate, which translates the phrase caught up with rapturus, uh, from what we get our English word rapture. Uh, here it is harpazo in the Greek. <clears throat> so Paul's statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is both dramatic and fantastic. He speaks of the Christians flying upward, caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We wouldn't believe this unless the Bible told us it were so. Not many more than we would uh, believe that God, that God became a baby, that he did miracles, and that he died on a cross, and that he lives in us. So Paul's language here is so straightforward and free from figurative speech that there is no missing his intent. The apostles' declarations here are made in the practical tone of strict of matter of fact and are given as literal details. Never was a place where the analogy of symbolical apocalyptic language was less applicable. Either these details must be received by us as a matter of practical expectation, or we must set aside the apostle as one divinely empowered to teach the church. So Paul's plain language leaves no doubt regarding the certainty of this event, yet the timing of this event in the chronology of God's prophetic plan is a matter of very significant debate among Christians. So many, though certainly not all, Christians believe that the, the Bible teaches that there will be a, an important seven-year period of history before the Battle of Armageddon and the triumphant return of Jesus. The debate about this catching away centers on where it fits in with this final seven-year period, popularly known as the Great Tribulation, with a reference to Matthew 24, verse 21, where it says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be. And so there are different viewpoints here. The pre-trib, uh, pre-tribulation rapture position believes believers are caught up before the final seven-year period. That is the view that I lean towards because I like to take, I believe the Bible says what it means. It says what it means. But let's go over some of these other ones. Uh, the mid-tribulation rapture believes that believers are caught up in the middle of the seven, five, uh, final seven-year period. The pre-wrath rapture position believes believers are caught up at some time in the second half of this sev final seven-year period and the post-tribulation rapture believes that believers are caught up at the end of this final seven-year period and so the adherents of these different positions uh, each believe their position is biblical and these differences of understanding should not make dividing lines of christian fellowship nevertheless it is my opinion that the pre-tribulation rapture position is biblically correct. Even other references to the return of Jesus within the First and Second Thessalonians are going to support this understanding. Also, I can't believe it would be post-tribulation to be caught up with Jesus as he's coming back because we are coming with him as he makes that second return. <clears throat> but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, shows that believers waiting for the return of Jesus, the clear implication is that they had hope of his imminent return, not the expectation of an imminent great tribulation. The 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, assures us that those believers who died would share equally with the living in the events of the rapture and resurrection, answering their fear that somehow the dead in Christ were at a disadvantage. But if Paul believed Christians would go through the great tribulation, he would count the dead in Christ as more fortunate than those living Christians who might very well have to endure the great tribulation. It would have been logical for Paul to comfort the Thessalonians with the idea that the dead in Jesus were better off because they won't have to experience the great tribulation. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 3 through 10 comforts Christians enduring hardship, promising them a coming rest while their persecutors will face certain judgment. But if Paul knew that the church was destined to pass through the great tribulation, it would have been more appropriate for him to warn these Christians about worse trials and suffering ahead rather than hold the promise of a coming rest. So the manner in which Jesus will gather us to himself is impressive, but the main point is that whatever the state of the Christians dead or alive at the Lord's coming, they will always be with the Lord. This is the great reward of heaven to be with Jesus. 
Death can't break our unity with Jesus or with other Christians. So we shall always be with the Lord is an important truth with many implications. It implies continuation because it assumes you're already with the Lord. It implies hope for the dying because in death we shall still be with the Lord. It implies future confidence because after death we are with the Lord. And it implies advancement because we will one day always be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. So Paul did not tell them to take comfort, but to give comfort. In the way that God works, we always receive comfort as we give it. And so the, the truth of the return of Jesus for his people and the eternal union of Jesus and his people is to be a source of comfort for Christians. This concluding statement of Paul only makes sense if the catching away of the previous verses actually delivers Christians from an impending danger. If the catching away only brings humanity to God for judgment, there is very little comfort in those words. And so, strange saying, comfort a man with the information that he is going to appear before the judgment seat of God. Who could feel comfort from those words? But just so we can rest on it, the truth of the return of Jesus for his people and the eternal union of Jesus and his people is to be a great source of comfort for Christians.